Channel Radio, Money Talk. I'm Simon Webster. I'm here with Dan Sherlock of Ricks and K, who's a corporate specialist. We're talking about directors' personal liability. Let me give you a couple of bits and pieces to be aware of. First off, Money Talk's got its own web show, website, moneytalk.guru. You can tweet the show at moneytalk underscore guru. And I think you can find Ricks and K on the web somewhere. Is that ricksandk.co.uk or something similar? It certainly is. Well, there we go. And your office is where? We have five of them. I'm based in Ashford and Seven Oaks. Right. And we've also got three down in Sussex, Uckfield, uh, Brighton and Hove and Seaford. You're all over the place. It's a big business, the law, these days, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, and there's an awful lot going on. Now, next week's show, I must just remember to mention this before we before we get into this, because this is a really interesting subject that I've um, I, I've been looking at on and off for years myself. But next week, we're talking about the General Data Protection Regulations. And before you all cringe and say, it's been done to death, let me just make one observation. Most people are looking at the GDPR in connection with marketing and the opting in of clients and everything else. That's what they're thinking about. And they're right to, because the fines for non-compliance with GDPR are absolutely blooming horrendous. But nobody that I have heard is really addressing employment law aspects of GDPR. And there are several one or two of them could bite you in the backside quite hard if you are not very careful. So next week, I'm joined with another friend of the show, another lawyer friend of the show, Henry Doswell from Doswell Law, employment law specialist, also based in Ashford. And um, Henry is going to be talking about the employment law aspects of GDPR. This week, back to the guest that we have in the, in the studio at the moment, the solicitor in shorts, Mr. Dan Sherlock. You're, you're a damn sight more comfortable in here than I am at the moment, mate. I'm seeing no clients today, so I took the gamble of just turning up a little bit uh, dressed down, shall we say. Well, I think that's probably very wise, very sensible, and very appropriate. And to be quite honest, I think too many people have got images of the professionals as being men in stuff suits with no sense of humour. And it's actually quite fun to do a radio show, be a bit human and talk about real issues that affect real people in, in words that hopefully they've got some hope of getting to grip with and understanding. Because you, you get some of this stuff wrong, stuff to do with money, stuff to do with the law, it can be quite a mess. So a lot of people set themselves up in business one way or the other. And on this show, we've picked up the fact that there's probably three or four ways of creating a business. You can be a sole trader. You just set yourself up. You may or may not get round to opening a bank business bank account. You probably should. Um, you can enter into business with somebody else, and that's effectively a partnership. Whether you've actually created a written partnership agreement, which you absolutely should, or not, you're still governed by the 1890 Partnership Act. And if you get that one wrong, you're jointly and severally liable, and that can be a real mess because if you're rich and your business partner's poor, you, the rich person, pay all the business debts, even though you're supposed to be jointly liable for them. If he hasn't got any money, they take all yours, so avoid that. Um, limited liability partnership, a slightly interesting hybrid sitting in the middle and outside the scope of most of today's conversation, unless Dan decides to go down that path. And then last but by no means least, limited liability um, companies, private limited companies for most people setting themselves up. Now, the main advantages for limited liability companies are most people think in terms of tax because dividends tax is lower than income tax and if you take your money out as dividends there's no national insurance so that can be quite an advantage and that's why so many limited companies have been set up on a uh, personal service basis and why so many B bbc presenters are in so much trouble because the bbc encouraged them to go down that way to avoid national insurance and that's all going wrong at the moment on a different level but the other reason for considering limited liability companies apart from tax is that if something horrible goes wrong with the business, it goes bust or the business gets sued, then in theory, your liability as a shareholder, your liability as a director is limited theoretically to the share capital value of the business. But it ain't necessarily so, is it, Dan? And no. <laughs> just, to, just to touch on what you were saying the, the limited liability status the clues in the name limited we all say limited we all know what a limited company is but it limits liability you are a separate legal personality in the eyes of the law your limited company if you have one is its own person yeah it makes its own decisions it stands on its own two feet and it has to pay its own debts so the general presumption in law is that you the director or you the owner are not liable for the debts of the business. 
But, and there's a big but. There are exceptions. <laughs> and that's why I'm here today. And we're going to do a whole show about the exceptions on that big but. I mean, it sounds like a show that we could do on a whole part of other subjects, but we're going to stay to the big but in what you may or may not be liable for. Now, it's an important point, and this is where people that don't play in this arena may get slightly confused, and it's worth just taking a minute to position this. A limited company, as Dan has said, is a legal person in and of itself. It can sue and be sued. It can buy and own real property, and land and buildings typically, which interestingly a partnership come. And you're in the situation where um, it confers a legal status in and of itself. A limited company is owned by its shareholders, and most of us are familiar with this because shares traded in the stock market are shares in ownership in ICI or BP or Vodafone or whatever. But, of course, quite often, two people will set up a company together, a husband and wife or mates or people who've got a shared business interest, and they will set up the company together and they will be 50-50 shareholders, a subject to which we will return because both of us have had nightmare experiences on that relatively recently. 50-50 director shareholders, a real potential issue if you don't sort it properly. But then different people run the company, the directors. Now, they could sometimes be shareholders and directors, could be the same person, but in the capacity of shareholders, they own the business. In the capacity as directors, they run the business. And, of course, shareholders could appoint totally separate directors to run the business. So you've got three parties in the relationship. The limited company itself, which is an entity in and of itself, the directors who run it on a day-to-day -day basis, and the shareholders who own it. And it gets even more complicated when you put a company pension scheme alongside it and you introduce the passage of, 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 of a workplace pension trust or SAS and you have trustees and you have members of the pension scheme and they could all be the same person acting in four or five different capacities. Today, we're going to talk about directors and sometimes shareholders in their capacity as owners and controllers of businesses. So we set up our limited company and effectively these days you have... What they, I think they, we used to call it adopting table A, and you now refer to model articles. Talk, talk to us about model articles, the piece of paper that controls companies, and why it's so important, and what else you need to do around that. Well, all companies, when they're incorporated, they have to have an internal governance. <laughs> this is the rule, or these are the rules that the company and its directors will follow, and that the shareholders will will sit back and say, "Well, yeah, we're not going to change these unless there's a." good reason to do so but this is this is the way it's going to be done whether that is regulating how the board make decisions or regulating how uh, and when and how often the the members get a say on the the board's conduct so the articles is key the articles are key to the functioning and the internal governance of the company it's effectively the director's rule book isn't it it yes. defines the scope of the director's power to do stuff and if they, if they act outside those powers, there's a lovely legal expression, which I love quoting, ultra vires. It's one of those lovely Latin expressions that for me as a non-lawyer, I enjoy knowing that I know. But acting outside the scope of your powers is actually a criminal offence in lots of issues. It certainly can yes, be a civil yeah. offence as well. So you've got to be very careful when you become the director of a company to understand what you're actually allowed to do legally because you may not be allowed to do all the things that you think you are allowed to do. So read those model articles and make sure that they cover all the things that you need to be covered. A, a good example. Uh, just this morning, I was in email communication with, uh, with the other side in a situation. I represent a, uh, a shareholder uh, who was a director. Mm -hmm. uh, they came to me and said, there's something on company's house. It's my resignation form. I didn't resign. So I went back to the other director and I said, well, we understand that uh, they've resigned. I have it on good authority for my client that they did not resign. Would you like to point out the article within your company's governance that triggered this resignation? Because you can have deemed resignation. Yeah. The, uh, the reply was, what are, what are the articles? Can you tell me what they might be? <laughs> Whoops. Yes. So yeah. we, we clearly have somebody who has no idea how to govern the, the, the company, which exposes them to uh, a presumption that they are acting uh, in a prejudicial situation, which we can discuss. Or, or, or you could just say illegally and liable to get sued big time for proper damages. But hey, that's, a, that's just my opinion. What do I know? Yeah. How did you resign a director? 
Not sure. Yeah, I just I just filled in this form and told Companies House in a legal declaration that this person has handed in their resignation. Or when they hadn't, that is it's amazing really, isn't it, when you when you actually unpick some of the things you see people doing and, and you go, Why did you do that? Well, I thought I could. Why? No answer there. Dan's just sort of shaking his head. I don't know. We, we don't want to go down this path. I think it might get a little bit, um, whatever the word is, a little bit sus. Okay. So really, you've got to understand the scope of your powers when you are appointed as a director. Read the model articles and make sure that they conform to what your understanding of your role is and that you have the necessary powers within the articles to fulfill your obligations as a director. Otherwise, you can't really act. That's understood. The other thing that you need to understand is that there is no distinction in terms of your legal liability between executive and non-executive directors. And Ooh, yes. in terms of the law, the, the, the law recently changed uh, to uh, bring in statutory powers uh, against uh, persons of significant control who act as de facto or shadow directors. So the law is getting savvy with people who they, they in the old days, they may put in a, a, what you might call a patsy. And you'll just run the company for me, but I'll tell you everything you're meant to do. Yeah. Well, the, the law is caught up and it's saying, well, if we, if we see that you are controlling the company and you are not a, uh, an appointed director, we'll still come after you. So just because you think you are not, uh, on the, um, you're, you're not on the list of, uh, of directors appointed at company's house, it doesn't mean that you have carte blanche authority to do whatever you want. And you can come at this the other way, can't you? Because there can be particularly people in senior management positions who, you know, a general manager of a business is a board of directors and the general manager has got operational control of the business on a day-to-day basis. He is effectively de facto a shadow director. He is running the business. And all of a sudden you can find that somebody in that position has actually got some measure of personal liability if he acts outside his powers or overreaches himself or makes a couple of bad decisions. So actually this whole thing about running businesses suddenly gets to be a lot more complicated. The simple veil of incorporation that I learned about when I was at accountancy school 30 years ago or so, and nearly 35 years ago, scary thought that is, is actually going out, going slowly down the swanee. And you're now in the situation where if you act like a director, talk like a director, contract like a director, move like a director, you're liable like a director if you mess up. And that sort of re- raises, you, you mentioned, yes. I forgot, was directors and officers insurance, which is really quite important. If you- the, just before we get on to that, the other, the other side is flip it round. Um, a managing uh, executive, if you want to call him that, yeah. managing executive may be liable as a director. Um, under under statute these days. The other side is, why would a director want to delegate all of their executive or functional powers to a non-director? Because they still have a statutory duty as a director um, to act in the interests of the, of the business, to exercise independence and, and uh, reasonable care and skill. So if you've effectively shipped that off to somebody else, you can still be liable for your, if you want to call it negligence, but your total... Um, abrogation of responsibility. Abrogation of responsibility. Oh. So why would you? Uh, the managing executive may think I, I need to I need to have uh, a good look at my own powers here and whether or not I'm protected. But equally, a, a non-exec director, because that's what effectively they would be doing, is, is taking themselves out of an executive function. They themselves can still be liable. <sighs> Nothing is ever straightforward these days, is it? Nothing is ever straightforward. So the the real issue is that alongside model articles, particularly where there's more than one director of a company, and you can just have a company with one director these days, but uh, particularly where there's more than one, um, you really need, and, and the directors are also shareholders, you probably need to set up a shareholders agreement to actually stipulate who does what and where and what happens in a whole pile of circumstances. So what's the difference between the articles and a shareholders agreement for the uninitiated? Well, the shareholders agreement is a contract. It's a contract between the shareholders. Mm -hmm. And it tells them, well, we won't act in this way, which will prejudice you. We will continue as a part, well, a partnership, a, a yeah. shareholding partnership, as, as, as a group, as a group of people working together in business, in common with a view to partner and profit. Oh, that sounds like a partnership. But never mind. Yeah, I know what you mean. It, it recognises that there are certain things that you will collectively be bound by, and that is the the, the contract between you, uh, as to your ownership of the business, um, and it will uh, it, it will in most cases, and it should, 
be the primary document uh, so that the articles are secondary to it. So if there is a conflict between how the company is governed and run within the articles and that it comes up against something in the in the shareholders agreement the shareholders agreement should have the uh, the, the final say on this a good example would be in a bad lever situation uh, so yeah. this is where somebody leaves 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 the company swearing and saying he doesn't want to go and it's all gone horribly wrong uh, they're leaving badly that's what yes. we mean yeah what what you you may have is a situation where somebody is either removed forcibly yes. <laughs> from the building. Yes. No, Here's a thousand pounds. Buy removed yourself a new their, suit. Just don't go back to your desk. Go. They're removed as a director. Yeah. They've, they've done something that uh, has breached their, their their service agreement, and but they're also a shareholder, and they could be a significant shareholder. Mm. But what you will have is that situation where you think, well, I've got rid of them as a director, so they're not running the the business day to day, and they're not managing on the board. Uh, but they may be a controlling shareholder. They may be uh, an equal shareholder, and there could be deadlock in the shareholding. Well, you can have a situation where there is a bad lever, and the shareholder's agreement will then be triggered. For example, a, a simple clause would be, if you are no longer a director of the company, then it is an automatic uh, qualification under the shareholder's agreement that you have to sell or offer to sell your shares to the other shareholders. And the shareholder can't say, Hold on a sec. No, no, I'm not going to sell my shares to you. The shareholders agreement is secondary. No, it's the articles which govern this. No, it's the shareholders agreement which is primary. And that should always be the case. So if you are uh, you are in a company or you are considering it, uh, incorporating a company, um, not only get yourself uh, uh, articles which reflect what you want the company to do rather than the off-the-shelf, the model articles, which will, will which will apply by default. Get yourself a shareholders agreement if there is more than one shareholder. Mm. You may be equal shareholders. You may be majority and minority shareholders, but sooner or later you may have a situation where you you could be contemplating falling out. You could be in a situation where life changes, that uh, somebody who was a shareholder and director can, for health reasons or lifestyle reasons, or or any other reason, no longer want to be or can function to be a director. In that situation, the whole business, the structure of the business, could be predicated on you contributing in equal or pro rata uh, amounts to the to the success of the business but if that is fundamentally shifted by somebody no longer taking a part in the business have a mechanism by which the the reward uh, is is then shifted to reflect that whether that be a shareholder buyback uh, or whether that be uh, a, a situation where you can uh, reward the ongoing directors through their uh, their service the, the, the tax the tax may not work out in mm. your favor but it can still be overall, if you're paying more tax, it can still be fairer. Well, hold on a sec. I used to do 50% of the work for this business. Now I'm doing 100%. Why am I only getting 50% of the dividends? Mm. Remo have a mechanism by which you can remunerate yourself according to your your day-to-day -day input to the business. And, of course, this you very neatly led, in, led into my specialist area. Your specialist area is law. My specialist area is financial advice. And uh, in, in our world, in the financial advice world, the, 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 the two things that we always talk about with company directors is what happens if a director becomes seriously ill on a long-term basis or what happens if a director dies. And the, 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 the situation, the ill health is probably the biggest one because that's a grey area. A guy may or may not be able to come back. Um, who, who knows what that situation is going to be? And it's something you need to think about when you're drafting your shareholder agreement about what you're going to do in those circumstances. And it might be if you're off for more than a year and unable to fulfil your um, work obligations, then you have to sell your shares back to the business or, or, or whatever you would stipulate there. Um, but but the other one is what happens if a director dies because the next day his widow or worse still his girlfriend or worse still his girlfriend's lawyer or accountant show up at the boardroom table and say, where's my 50%? And you say, well, hang on, you've not actually contributed anything to the business. Don't matter. I'm entitled to 50% of the profits. You've got a track record of not taking salaries and paying 50% dividends. I'm not going to show up and do the work. It doesn't matter. I'm entitled to 50% of the profits and you can't take some money out. That can get very messy, and we've seen this. The insurance companies who sell this stuff through financial advisors quite, have a whole host of um, stories they can tell where companies have gone very badly wrong for, for relatively modest amounts of month, um, modest amounts of money in terms of life insurance premiums, 25, 50, 100, 200 pound a month, whatever it happens to be, in business terms, relatively modest amounts of money to protect the future of the company so that the surviving director can buy the deceased director's shares and the 
deceased director's family can have what they really want, which is cold, hard cash. Fair value cash. Fair value cash. And you would normally put in a, a, a valuation clause in the, in, in the um, shareholders agreement to say that, 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 that it would either be agreed between the parties as the value of the shares or in the event of a dispute it would go to the company's accountants or a third party accountant or the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales who would appoint a valuer to actually determine what that value of the business was and that would be the price for 50% of the shares. Hopefully, the life insurance would have been kept up to date in terms of sum assured and would be sufficient to meet that liability. But if you had to buy, I mean, if I, in my situation, I'm very lucky, I'm married to my business partner, we get on very well. If I keel over, I've willed her all my shares, she's got complete control of the business automatically, it hasn't cost her a penny. If I'm in business with somebody else and I keel over, the company needs the half the value of my uh, of itself in cash, or the other director does, to buy me out. And the chances are they're not going to have half a million or a million pounds lying around to do that. So life insurance becomes really quite important. Key, the key point that we really made in the first segment of the show is limited liability is almost certainly the way to go. But you've got to be really careful to set it up correctly. Just adopting the model, model articles that get printed out by boilerplate company formation companies when you pay your 20 quid to buy a company. Dan's actually sort of crossing himself and saying, don't ever do that. Go and take proper legal advice and do it properly. Or if you buy a company on the sh- off the shelf, at least get the perishing solicitor to go, well, you're not a perishing solicitor, at least get a really wise solicitor, uh, preferably in shorts, to rewrite your, your model articles so that they actually make some sense. And then at the same time, and this is the really important point, put in place a shareholders agreement that's going to govern the relationship between the director shareholders in their various capacities and do it now before it all goes horribly wrong. Yes, it's all very well to say, well, these things are never going to happen. They will. Yeah. They will. People, unfortunately, die. Yeah. And families then have to pick up the pieces, one of which is, why are we not getting the same income from this business that we used to get? Well, when when the, the husband or the wife was the director, they could just in- declare interim dividends. They could keep the financial tap on so the family's lifestyle is maintained. When you are no longer in the situation where you have the family member as the director, the other directors will look at this in a corporate corporate governance structure and say, well, can we can we do that anymore? Can we keep ta- um, declaring interim dividends and, and keep the, the tap on? And they may not do so. Uh, a, a fundamental shift like that may lead to a reassessment. What do we want to do with this business? Do we want to get in a finance director? Do we want to get in marketing directors? Do we want to run this now on, on, on a proper corporate, corporate, corporate basis, basis yeah. rather than as a quasi-partnership? Uh, and so the, these things can change. And families who have known each other for decades can fall out. So plan ahead because mm. you, you can find that this just it end up it ends up with people looking at the nuclear options. And, and then everybody this. loses. And the, and, the, and the real situation is, isn't it, that, that effectively if you're in a, uh, a 50-50 company or a relatively small company, most director shareholders will choose to take the majority of their income as dividends rather than salary and bonus because they pay less tax. Yeah. So the, 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 the income is distributed, as they say in the trade, below the line. And it's effectively and, – and that's fine. It's perfectly legitimate, perfectly legal. Nothing wrong with it at all. Everybody does it, including me. It's just normal business practice. But – if you're in a situation where you have, let's say, you're distributing income of £100,000 and each director shareholder was getting 50000 a year in, 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 in dividend income in their capacity as shareholders, but actually in return for their work to the business, then you go to the situation where you need to pay £50,000 to somebody else to come in who's not a shareholder, your profit goes down from £100,000 to £50,000. And the one that was re- relying on the um, dividend who's still doing the work has just taken a 50% pay cut, as has the... So, uh, the widow or the um, the, the family of, of, of the director, director that's died. So it really is crucially important to make sure that you have protected your position in the event of death or illness, long-term illness, because if you don't, it can go horribly wrong. And it's really important also, and I, I've actually had personal involvement with a case only in the last couple of weeks where a company was set up with two 50% director shareholders now if both had remained directors you would have had a board logjam and that would have been disastrous and the company probably would have imploded and everything else but what actually happened was one of the one of the directors stepped down and the surviving director then carried on running running the business 
But then the 50% shareholder, who is no longer a director, is starting to feel that they're not getting a fair crack of the whip because the company's not making any profits. The surviving director's drawing salary, but there's no dividends, so he's put money into the business. He's not getting a return. It's so often that people don't have that honest, uh, that honest chat between themselves. It's just day like, one, you, day if one. If you're not turning up at 9 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, as the case may be, yeah. you're not putting the time into the business. Why am I going to give you 50% of the, of, the, of the profits of this business? It's not fair. Mm. And that has to be addressed at the start. Because when, when you've got a, 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 a cool head and you're actually looking at this, you can make an informed decision based on facts in the hope that these things never happen. Because let's face it, 99% of such legal agreements just go straight into a filing cabinet and never see the light of day. And so, and we all say, oh, man, thank goodness, because it means that you, 99% of cases, businesses are reasonably well run, and, I, and either they just evolve over time or, or, or they just carry on. But in that 1% of cases where something horrible goes wrong, then you need to go to the filing cabinet and say, these are the rules that we agreed when we weren't fighting. We, we now have to look at this. Now, you can decide that you want to be in breach of this agreement and create all sorts of fuss, and you, and you can. But if we ultimately end up in court, they're going to look at this piece of paper that you signed 10 years ago when we agreed that, and it's all over, and you, you end up for the cost. Look at it as an insurance premium. Yeah. You, you're investing at the start in commercial lawyers to draft something for you which avoids two things. First of all, it avoids you having a misunderstanding in the future because yep. it's already taken into account. The second thing it avoids is the cost of me, the litigation lawyer. Just have a smile on your face at that thought. Yeah, well, actually, you know, you know, Dan is actually looking uh, looking quite well fed. So obviously, there's a lot of people that are not avoiding Dan's costs. Uh, 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 I, I, I say well fed. Unfortunately, I'm the fat one in this relationship, so I'm not. I'm not. I do. I don't mean anything else. It's not like he's. No, never mind. So we've talked about this a little bit. We've gone through. We've gone through the fact that you really need to be careful when you set up a company. It appears really straightforward. Online company formation agents say, give us 25 quid with your credit card and you become a company director and you own the company. Immediately, you've got a legal obligation to file an annual return. And if you don't do that, you get struck off by company staff. So just the act of forming a company causes you a legal obligation just doing that. It does. And there's a lot of housekeeping you have to think about from the very start uh, because your obligations uh, outside of the company can still be ongoing. If you have entered into contracts before incorporation, you are still personally liable for those. Uh, the, 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 the thing that jumps up and bites you on the backside is the joint and several liability. Now, as a director, you won't have that, but in many cases you are asked to give a personal guarantee or an indemnity. Don't. <laughs> I, I've got what my, my, my... When asked to give a personal guarantee, I have one word of advice, and the advice is... Don't do it. Sometimes it's unavoidable, particularly if you're looking for bank finance to set up a business or whatever. You just can't get away from it. And the bank have reasonably, re reasonably want you to say, well, we're prepared to give you the money, but we want you to accept that if this goes wrong, you should have, you should have some skin in this fight as well. You should be, uh, accept some liability. And the pushback on that is if you're prepared to give me the money, why are you asking for a fail-safe safety net? You have to trust me. I have to trust you. But, again, some people have to give mm. personal uh, guarantees. The difference between a personal guarantee and a, an indemnity needs to be understood as well. A lot of people think they're just the same thing. A Including me, by the way. A so. personal guarantee is triggered if there is a default by the primary debtor. So if the company has failed to pay on the prescribed date, the prescribed amount, mm. it triggers what's called the PG, the personal guarantee. An indemnity is where you don't have to have default by the primary debtor. You are a primary debtor. Indemnity means that you are indemnifying the debts of the company as if you are a principal contracting party as well. So a personal guarantee, you need to have default by the primary debtor before a personal guarantee can be activated and they come after you individually. An indemnity says, don't need default. I'm asking you to pay personally. I don't care if the company pays me or not. I can and I am asking you to pay me personally, and that's a primary debt. I, I've never heard of that. You've obviously seen that, otherwise you wouldn't be bringing it up. Where, where does it happen? Well, a lot of people will have documents which say this is a personal guarantee or indemnity. The issue is, has there been a default? If it's a personal guarantee and there has not been default, they cannot transfer the debt onto you. Yeah. That's where some sometimes people get the wobbles that the company's uh, solvent. And they think, okay, I won't wait 
to be a creditor in line under a, a liquidation or in, a, in administration. What I will do is I'll just knock on the door of the director and I'll say, you know, you signed this document. Well, could you please keep paying me? I don't want the company to keep paying me because I think it's going to go to the wall. And that's, and that's the triggering the indemnity. That's the indemnity. But where, where, because banks don't normally ask, do the banks normally ask, they normally ask for personal guarantees Guarantees. rather than indemnities. So, so, so who would normally ask for an indemnity? Because I've never seen one personally. They're not, they're not that common. All right. Uh, So don't, don't worry. It's, it's, it's generally the case that financial institutions will ask for a personal guarantee, but just be careful because if you are signing an indemnity, you're back to being joint and severally liable. So it's just a piece of small print to watch out if you're in business with somebody. It's a good idea. This is why all bank agreements these days require you to take legal advice before you sign them. Very much so, because there are ways in which you can challenge the Mm. the liability of a director under one of these documents. Personal guarantee? Well, where's the consideration for this? Mm. Consideration is a contractual phrase we use, which is essentially, if I'm being asked to sign up as a guarantor to this contract, it must be in my personal uh, interest to do so. Where is the passing of something of value to me where is the benefit mm. to me in entering into this contract? So you can, you, you can fight these di- in different ways. But essentially, that is one way in which you as a director can be held liable if you have signed one of these documents and they hold water. That's interesting you should say that because I've actually got a client who has approached me about a personal guarantee he gave in respect of a business bank loan and the company unfortunately ceased to trade and the bank has now come after him for, I think it's about twenty five thirty thousand 30000 mm. And he's going... I had a policy. I never signed personal guarantees. I'd have no recollection of signing a personal guarantee. I certainly wouldn't have signed a personal guarantee. The bank's certain that he did. There's probably a piece of paper somewhere, but it will be very interesting to see um, because it will have well predated. This. It was a business overdraft rather than the business loan that he's apparently on the hook for. And it'll be very interesting to see whether he did get a personal benefit from it and if there is some form of challenge that he could put into that. Because Very much. And the other thing about personal guarantees is If there is no personal benefit to you as the guarantor, did you execute it as a deed? If you did, it gets round the consideration point and you can still be liable. If it was not executed as a deed, there has to be the benefit passing, the the consideration passing. So most guarantees, if entered into as a deed, there's there's virtually no argument on this this point because it's it's Mm. a standalone document which is no longer contractual. It's a, it's, a, it's a formal promise by deed to pay. Uh, but if guarantees are not executed properly, I had a situation where somebody actually just, they printed one out themselves. They sat in a car with, with the director of the company and said, I don't reckon your company is good for this anymore. Could you, key, could you sign this, the dotted line? Uh, it wasn't executed as a deed. Uh, it didn't make reference to uh, the director having a personal benefit under this separate contract. And I, I ran rings around the other side on that one. So it's not the be all and end all. If someone says, well, you've signed a PG or an indemnity, I'm coming after you. I would like to look at that document and say, okay, does this thing hold water? But that's, that, that's just one aspect of personal liability. And there's, there's plenty others. Uh, I don't know if we can, if we got time to go into other things before you wanted to, to, to cut for a, Another side. Well, I, I, I'm looking at my notes from our green room conversation before we uh, b- b- before we do, and we just got time for a quick story. I, uh, you, you told me the story. I know, and you know that it is a legal requirement that you put your uh, place of incorporation and your company reference number on the foot of your email and on your website. That is actually, as I understand it, and I think you confirmed, but you might correct me if I'm wrong. It's actually a legal requirement that you are obliged to do that as a matter of course. Yes. Now, you mentioned a case earlier where somebody had failed to do this and it bit them in the bottom fairly hard. Fairly hard indeed. We had a situation, it was a construction contract. We had about £70,000 of debt. Uh, our client wasn't paid because the quality of the work was, was insufficient uh, for, uh, for the, the customer. Um, our client then didn't pay the supplier to them of these products saying, well, hold on a sec, I'm not being paid for this because the the goods weren't good enough. Uh, I'm not paying you. So far, so good, you would expect. Our client was then sued as a limited company uh, for non-payment and breach of contract. We then kicked back with, uh, actually, this was a failure to deliver according to the specification, failure of of merchantable quality, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not paying. They then had a look at their their company um, 
uh, uh, the the documents involved realized that nowhere on my client's documents did it say this is an incorporated company whether that be their trading literature that their, their terms and conditions their website their emails there was no indication that the, the the client I was representing at that time was an incorporated company and so what they did was they then filed a court a separate claim to be joining in the director personally which upped the ante considerably. I bet it did. And there was almost nothing I could do because they had never disclosed their trading uh, status as a limited company. Now, just, just as an interesting point of law, because I, I, I understand why the individual was joined to the action personally, but did the fact that he was joined to the action in his personal capacity void the defence that the supplied goods were not of merchantable quality. No, that wouldn't have voided the defence. What would have happened was the director would have then joined in saying two things. First of all, I'm not personally liable. If the court doesn't accept that argument, then I join with the rest of the defence, which is that these were dodgy goods. But what effectively did is it rather focused the mind of your client who went, whoops, maybe I'd be more inclined to try and settle on this and one just in case. My client is then facing two lawyers, Bill, yeah. because they're defending it on two counts. Ouch. I think that's a very interesting point to make. So bear in mind, just as a, as a total by the by, when you want to mitigate personal liability as an incorporated body, i.e. mitigate your liability as a director or a shareholder, if things go wrong, one of the things you actually need to do is comply with company's law and disclose your company registration number, your full company name on your website, on your email and on your letterhead. You don't need to disclose, interestingly, your VAT number in those in, in those places. You need to put that on your invoices. But that's a separate conversation, and it's really interesting. People get very confused about this. They start sending emails out with their VAT number on, which nobody actually cares about. But hey-ho, the law is a funny thing. And in the last section of the show, I thought I'd get Dan to give us a few top tips for making sure that you don't find yourself having to underwrite companies that have gone wrong with your personal money. So, Dan. What are your top tips? Go. Well, first thing to do is to have a stock take of what your duties are. Mm -hmm. As a director, know and understand them. There are certain duties enshrined in the Companies Act, which uh, you don't need to read, but you might want to. Uh, <laughs> about Section 171 onwards, if you really are that geeky. Uh, but I'll run through them. You have to act within the powers. That comes back to uh, the powers that are set out in the articles. Or so in your we, service contract. And also in the service contract. So act within the powers that the company has conferred yeah. on you and the members have conferred on the company. So don't enter into um, contractual obligations which you have not had sanctioned by uh, your service agreement or the article. Because if you do, you're personally liable, aren't you? And this is the you're biggest... You're personally liable for anything over and above the mandate that you have. Mm. You enter into a contract for £3 million worth of, uh, of, of goods or services. If the contract... Uh, sorry, if you are mandated only for £2 million, then the, uh, the other side can come after you personally for the million. Ouch. So we make, make, make sure you are acting within your powers. That's top, first, top, first top tip. What's next? Uh, to promote the success of the company. So uh, this feeds into what was the old fiduciary duty of loyalty and, uh, and fidelity to the company. If you're setting up another company and you're trying to run the two, then those who you are in business with in the first company can say, well, hold on a sec. That's a statutory power. We as a company can come after you as a director because you're running something on the side. Mm. And there's not much of an answer to that. Act to promote the success of your company at all times. If you can't, what are you doing? You, you can't act, uh, you can't have two caps on at the same time. No. All right. Uh, running through another one to exercise independent judgment. Do not Ooh. follow the chairman's decision and think it doesn't matter. He's made the decision. As a director, you have to have an input into the government. A license to argue with the boss actually enshrined in company law. That's an interesting one. Not a lot of people, I would imagine, not a lot of people want to challenge that one too much internally, but actually it's really important because if you know that the, the, the boss is making a bad call, you really should be on the record saying, I'm really not sure we should be doing this boss it because of this, that, and the other. It is a legal duty. Yeah, a so, legal duty. You could get sued for not actually doing it. So yes, it's you can. stuck between a rock yes, and a hard place, big time. Uh, you've also got to exercise reasonable care, skill, and diligence. Mm. If you don't have the requisite uh, care and skill, to answer a particular question. You have to go and find it from somebody. That's why people have accountants, lawyers, and other experts to make decisions. You didn't say financial advisors. I'm and deeply... Uh, th advisors. Thank you, Dan. Oh, I'll play the game. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so this is, this is where you bring in what you don't have as a skill set in the board. Mm. Because as a duty, you, uh, you have it. 
So the company re requests that you, you do that. Um, if you don't know the answer, find somebody who does. Yeah. And that's when you, the board can make the decision. Saying I didn't know that is not really a legitimate excuse, is it? You've actually, no. you've, you're actually obliged to use your brain as a prudent man of business and say, I don't know too much about that. This could be a problem for my business. I need to get some expertise in to sort it out. Yes. Running through some others as well. Avoid conflicts of interest. Yeah. If you're making decisions which can reward fellow directors in a capacity as a shareholder, etc., then that could be a conflict of interest. Are you awarding a contract to your, your brother or your sister or your, your, your daughter or your son? Uh, those are situations where you may have to declare, I have an interest in this. It may not be in the interest of this company purely for me to award that contract. And that can bite you on the backside because if the company ever finds itself in a, in a, in a insolvency situation, then you as a director can be personally liable. The insolvency practitioner could look at that and say, we could have got this contract 50% cheaper from somebody that wasn't a family member, yes. and you've just pushed the company to bankruptcy by your own foolish actions that were unfairly prejudicial. Yes. Oh, so yes, good one to watch. Conflicts of interest. Um, not to accept benefits from third parties. That's oh. a lovely one. Uh, that's, that falls in towards briberies. But mm. essentially, are you doing things which are in the interest of the company, or are you personally? Mm. Ask yourself that question, because if it falls into the latter, then you can be liable to the company to repay and restore any loss that the company suffers as a result of taking that decision, which was in your personal interest. There's been a recent bribery act, hasn't there, in the UK? I know about this because we've just rewritten our staff handbook for the business in the advent of GDPR. and We got a bit bigger. We got more staff. We better have a look at this. Oh, gosh, we haven't looked at it for 10 years. And I think it was something like that. And we went through and looked at all our policies. We've got bribery policies and a health and safety policy that covers about three pages. And we work in an office. It really made me cringe. But there's all this stuff that you need to do. But it, it's not just your responsibility as an employee of a business, you've also got a sort of higher responsibility as a director that you've got to act not just in terms of your internal company rule book as communicated to you by your boss. You've got to act in the interests of the company as dictated effectively by common sense and law. And yes. that's a far higher test. Bribery isn't just awarding contracts to Southeast Asia. Mm. It can be something in the UK as well. And if the Bribery Act doesn't apply, then you can look at, uh, at Section 176 that I mentioned. The company can come after you for doing something which was in your personal interest uh, that you took a bung for. Mm. Um, another thing as well, if you do make a decision that the company is rewarded for a contract, so that you, know, you say, well, it wasn't me personally, the Bribery Act can be triggered. Now, that can, um, in a secondary way, be a decision which was taken, which was not in the interests of the success of the company because the company can suffer a fine. Mm. So did you take a decision which you did not re you did not receive personal re reward for? But you left the company exposed as a result of that decision, and that was a bad decision, therefore you're liable so for you it. So you get the knock on the door secondary. Ouch. Yes. So those, those are running through some of the obligations you have as, as a director, statutory obligations. There are others as well, as I mentioned. There's duties of, uh, of fiduciary loyalty. So uh, these are the different types of, of, uh, of claims that can be made against you. In tort, tort isn't just negligence and nuisance claims. Tort can be conspiracy to injure. If you are giving information to a rival and that rival is poaching business, you can be inducing third parties to breach a, a contract. That is a tort, and you can personally be liable for your part in that. And tort is a wrong, isn't it? She's tort, yes, not it's, it's general, for wrong. It's, it's a general wrong. It's common law. Yeah. What has happened is the judges said, well, there's no, over the last few hundred years, there's no act of parliament which prescribes for this. So I'll just create a, a, a law which... A precedent, yeah. Precedent will be followed in the future. We, 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 slightly off topic, but just interesting. I used the word precedent in an internet chat forum this morning over an HMRC decision. They're appealing um, a, a lower tribunal of the tax commissioners about in specie pension contributions. It used to be possible you could make a pension, people made pension contributions in cash or in kind. So you could put a building straight into a pension contribution as long as the financial value was correct and you know if it was a hundred thousand pound building you that would be a cheap one hundred thousand pound building was going into the pension scheme at a valuation of a hundred thousand pounds you could claim tax relief on that contribution and the revenue recently got very nasty about that and said no you can't it's got to be a cash contribution otherwise you can't claim tax relief uh, and and uh, a very brave uh, pension company took them to the uh, lower 
and the pension company won. HMRC lost. And HMRC have just uh, appealed it. And it was being discussed by financial advisors. And I said, it's an HMRC attempt to overturn years of precedent. And two or three people actually said, yes, precedent should be important. So I was, I was quite pleased with that one. It's nice when you make a comment that your peers agree with. It's, Watch this space with the upper tier tax tribunal. Yeah, I, it, it's an interesting one because on if, if there's any justice, the, the, pen, the, the HMRC should not be allowed to define pension contributions as cash only because on the same basis HMRC have never defined income they've given you a whole pile of remuneration types that are income and are taxable but as soon as they say in order to be deemed remuneration and taxable it's got to fall within this definition then some smart accountant or lawyer or financial advisor, because we're all the same as each other, will find a way of getting benefit or value to a an otherwise taxpayer that falls outside the definition. So they've never defined income. It's actually an established joke in UK tax law. They've never done it. So on the same basis, they can't now define pension contributions. It's 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 not a level playing field. And while the state should have some some advantages, I suppose, to stop us all avoiding paying their tax, you should um, you should try and keep the playing field very, fairly level. Otherwise, the state's got too much power. And and. The other thing as well lawyers get worked up about is an inconsistency, and that's a clear yeah. inconsistency. If they are trying to define uh, one concept but are quite happy to, to kick it into the long grass for others which suit their purposes, that has to be something which the, the tribunal um, won't allow. So let, let's, let's see. Well, it, 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 I've got a lawyer agreeing with me. That's got to be a record. I think I'm, I, I think, I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Guys, it's amazing how fast the time flies when we do this show. You, you think we're taking on a technical subject. How are we going to find and fill an hour with it? But in fact, Dan's made it so interesting. Thank you very much indeed. You've really got to make sure that if you set up a company, you set it up right. You don't just look at the standard paperwork that's supplied. You do something sensible and um, draw up a list of all sources of funding and a financial timetable for funding levels to be met. Keep a record of all your conversations. with When you're setting up with somebody, do this. Maintain regular meetings and minute them. And if the company is listed or quoted, comply with statutory obligations to disclose information. In case you think I'm super clever... Dan just handed me a piece of paper with that written on because he thought that was a good way to end. And he was right. So if you're going to go and set yourself up in a company, I think you should pop down to Ricks and Kay and make sure that you've got your paperwork in order. And at the same time that you set up your direct to share purchase life insurance and critical illness insurance and health insurance to ensure the via future viability of your business in the event of the death or disability of a director. Dan, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming in. Wonderful. It's Thank been, you. It's been great.